Hello, and welcome to First Free Methodist Church. I'm so glad you can join us today. Uh, uh, first announcements I have to say is that this week we have launched our VBS this summer, and it is going to be going on all summer. So if you have, if you call yourself a friend of the First Church here, uh, we have pickups for you in our lobby that you can come and pick up, and it's for the whole family. It's not just for the young ones, so please come and do that as soon as you can. Uh, secondly, I would also like to say that we are starting our backyard gatherings tonight. And so if you would like to uh, attend the backyard gathering, please just let us at the church know and we can uh, put you into our group. Unfortunately, we are limited to 30 people because of the Saskatchewan Health Authority guidelines. So the sooner you get that in, the better. And just another side note with that is please bring your own chairs, food, drinks, anything like that that you will come in and take out and we can enjoy some fellowship together. Um, I believe that is all for our announcements today. So I will, if you will join with me in prayer, that'd be great. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for the great weather that you've been providing for us and for the farmers. I thank you for the days of rain that we've had to help the crops grow and for your provision in that growth, Lord. And Lord, I just pray for all those who are in our church who need your healing touch. We just pray that you would be with them, that your peace and your presence would be washing over them, and that they would feel your love with them as they go through this healing process. And Lord, I just ask that as we continue our worship service here, that it would be glorifying to you that... Uh, ourselves would shrink and that you would become the forefront of all of our thoughts and our words today, Lord. Uh, we pray all these things in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, let us continue our worship in song. the New King James Version in the book of Psalms, chapter 145, verses 8 through 15. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. 
They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. This is the word of the Lord. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, and mercy for Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior, the hope of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find all my fears and failures And fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in. Now I surrender Savior salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus shine your light and let the whole world see for the glory of the risen King. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the
Well, we have launched our summer series fully. Get out there. Hope you enjoyed the VBS videos for those of you that watched this week. Lots of fun there with Pastor Patty and the gang putting together some fun stuff. And we're continuing to match the series, and we're going to talk this morning about get out there, get out of the boat. When Tracy and I first got married, among the gifts that we received from family and friends was a gift from her grandma of very fine bone china. The china that her grandma gave her was actually from Tracy's great-grandmother. It was very old and very beautiful. The truth of the matter is, I don't know a lot about fine bone china, and Tracy doesn't know a whole lot either. And so we asked a friend of ours who was working in a good jewelry store that sold these nice things, fine china and other jewelry, to help us understand the value of this china. And we learned where it was from. It was from England and the type of pattern it was. And then our friend did the thing that you sometimes see if you've ever watched Antique Roadshow, told us the appraisal of this set of china that we'd been given. We were shocked, not at the low value, but the incredibly expensive cost of this china. Then our next thought was, well, what do we do with this stuff? You have this very expensive china that there was no way we could afford to replace. So the question was, what do we do now? And we came to see two options. The first was to say, you know what, it's too valuable. We can't afford to replace it, so we're not going to take the risk and just either leave it in a box and display maybe one plate on a wall and say, you know, we have this very precious china and not worry about getting it chipped or broken and keep it in the box. The second way to respond is to say, no, 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 it's too valuable not to use. The gift was intended to be given to bring people joy so that when you hosted a dinner, you could have this nice china to use. And if we didn't use the china, then we would be robbing the joy of those who gave it, as well as for we who had received this wonderful gift. Each of us have been given a pre precious gift by God through Jesus. And we need to understand that God wants us to open up that gift and to use it. And this morning we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture that speaks to that choice of taking the risk or playing it safe. Matthew chapter 14 is the place where you can find this uh, account. Starting at verse 22 is where I'm going to read this morning. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, crying out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter cried, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. This is quite a day in Jesus' life. As you look back to the beginning of chapter 14, it's here in this same day that Jesus gets the news as he's with his disciples that his cousin, John, the baptizer, has been beheaded by Herod. So Jesus is in the process of trying to grieve and he heads out in a boat to cross the lake with his disciples so he can have some time. 
And as he gets to the other side of the lake, people have realized where he was going, and they've ran ahead of him. And so as Jesus and his disciples land on shore, he looks and sees not just a few people, but over 15,000 people who had followed him. As he has compassion on them, he does ministry and he holds a healing service. And then in this moment, he calls to his disciples saying, you know, they're here, they're hungry, it's getting late, you feed them. And another lesson happens. And the disciples are shocked and don't know what to do. And then they find the loaves and the fish. Jesus blesses it. Feeding of over 15,000 people. It's after that, that Jesus says to his disciples, guys, get out there. You get in the boat, get out there. I need to go and pray. I'm going to go and find some quiet time with my heavenly Father. And so the disciples head into the boat, and on the way, as they're trying to cross the lake, a huge wind blows up. Now, if you've ever been in a boat, you maybe understand what it is to have you know, sudden storm come up. And it's telling to me as we read the passage that these are experienced, not everyone, but there's several in the boat that are experienced fishermen who've spent their entire lives on the water. They were having trouble. They're concerned for their safety. Jesus, from his vantage point up on the mountainside, looks out across the water and he sees them and again has compassion on his disciples. Now, there's something happening here because we read that Jesus walks out on the water towards them. And in Mark's account, the Gospel of Mark says that Jesus intended to pass them by. That's a reminder of something that happened in the Old Testament. A leader by the name of Moses that was desiring to know God more, to have a deeper faith, to better understanding of who Almighty God was, And Almighty God intended to reveal himself to Moses by passing him by as he hid in the cleft of the rock. Now here Jesus is revealing himself to his disciples in greater measure. He must have looked strange because the disciples, they don't look to Jesus walking on the water and see Jesus. They think he's a ghost. In this moment of terror, being caught between the power of the wind and the waves, thinking they're going to drown, there is this bizarre nature about it. I think maybe some of it, it's like when you see someone out of context. It's hard to know it's them. Maybe they're in a place where you expected them to be somewhere else, and there's something else going on, and they look a little different, and so you're not expecting it's them. But as Jesus walks to them, on the water, he reveals to them further that he is, truly is, God's Son. The disciples are having their faith shaken. Take a moment and and drink in the situation. Don't just rush through it. Let it hit you. I think it's easy for us when we read passages like this to say, oh, you know, I I would be one of those people who would look and know it's Jesus, I could tell, you know, I'm, I'm that good. I think it took great faith to see Jesus. And I think Jesus often comes when he's least expected. And Jesus, seeing their fear, he calls out to them, you know, don't worry, guys, take heart, take courage. It's me. It's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter, seeing Jesus, he calls out to him, Lord, if it's really you, then tell me to come to you walking on the water. In those times of testing, we get to choose, don't we? We have to wrestle it through. Am I going to play it safe? Or am I going to step out in faith in this moment? And here is this beautiful picture of Peter opening up his gift from God, seeking to use it. There's no guarantees he's going to walk on the water. 
I think many times when we read this story, what comes to our hearts and minds is, oh right, this is the story where Jesus is walking on the water and Peter, you know, steps out and starts to sink. He really, oh, poor Peter, it's too bad what happened to Peter, sinking down in those waves. But we need to stop for a moment and remember that Jesus had 12 apostles, 12 guys in the boat. One gets out to walk on the water. 11 guys sit back in the boat. Peter did something. He took a risk. If it's you, Lord, command me to come to you and I'll go. That is extreme discipleship. If you want me to follow you, just say the word and I'm there. As I think of the passage, I put myself there and I wonder what would I do? What would I choose? What would you choose? The water or the boat? The boat is safer, it's more secure, it's comfortable. And you look to the water and it's rough and the wind is blowing, the waves are high. But it is Jesus calling. Here's the thing. There is a price to pay for, as John Ortberg says in his book, if you want to walk on water, get out of the boat. For being boat potatoes, there's a price to be paid. For choosing to play it safe. Because if we never risk anything for our faith, then our faith never grows. We end up stagnating and our lives move towards spiritual death. That's really the tragedy of the unopened gift. Jesus told the story uh, to his disciples of a master who was going away and he gives his servants, one servant gets five talents, another gets two talents, and the third gets one. And the first two set about to use those talents and to earn more. When you look at the value of those talents, scholars tell us that it was an expression of a sum of money that was worth 15 years' wages. This is a very generous gift. And the first two servants realize it, the wonderful gift they've been given, and they seize the opportunity. But the third servant is another matter, and they end up doing nothing. When the master returns and speaks with all of them, he rewards the first two, and the third servant describes being afraid of what the master would do. Kind of like where you would blame circumstances. I, I develop my gifts more, but, but my boss won't let me. You know, I, I'd pursue another job, but the money I, I need the money from this one right now. Or I'd like to grow more spiritually, but I just, I don't have the time for that kind of stuff. We can wait and wait and wait for the perfect timing, for the right when, and then we miss out. Maybe the first servant that received the one talent felt jealous of the other two. Maybe in the comparison he got angry Here's what happened, though, at the end of the day. When standing before that master, he's not asked the question, what did you do with what you didn't have? No, that servant is asked the question, what did you do with what you had? Fear makes us stay in the boat. And as we're going to look at Next week, fear makes us disobey God. In the story of the master that Jesus describes the master as a hard man, that's what the third servant that received the one talent says. And the master doesn't correct him. He doesn't say, what do you mean to say that I'm a a hard master? What do you mean to say you were afraid of me? He says, that's right. What? You did with what I gave you matters. 
And that third servant isn't judged for doing bad things. He's judged for doing nothing. He's called wicked and lazy. He's lost purpose and meaning. There's a challenge within our society, within our culture. We're so dedicated to comfort. It's been an interesting experiment these past few months. We're simply called right now to social distance. To being set apart, to being at home, being careful about being out. Pretty comfortable. And yet, people are so much seeking comfort in their own way that now they're pushing limits. God calls us to take appropriate risks. Risks of trusting him. And Peter sees what Jesus is doing and he wonders if he should join him. And he says, call me, Jesus. If it's you, call me and I'll come to you. And Jesus calls and Peter goes. He gets out of the boat. No matter what happened for the rest of Peter in his life. Yes, there were failures. Yes, there were moments where he messed up. Big times. He denied Jesus three times. He did things where he was foolish. Yes. But in Jesus, in Peter... As Jesus restored him, Peter could always look back to those moments, especially this moment here, and whatever he faced and remember that he stepped out of the boat and he walked on water. This morning, as we think about our faith, as we think about our choices, we need to ask ourselves the question, you know, what, what is the deepest dream that God would have for me, that I would dream with him. How much am I growing these days in my faith? Do you want to be known as the person with great potential but never really tried anything? Or maybe you, like Peter, have already stepped out of the boat in faith but you find yourself looking at the waves and looking at the wind and you're afraid. And you feel like you're going under. Just like Peter, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. The one who calls us out of the boat. And when we do, he lifts us up. He lifts us up out of are sinking out of the miry clay, as the psalmist writes, and he gives us a firm footing, and he brings strength and peace, joy and hope. This morning, what is the boat that you're in, that Jesus is calling you from? Calling you to get out there, to get out and to walk on the water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and for the lessons that you give us through your word. And today, we recognize that Peter was a good example of one that took the risk. Help us as your followers, O God, to not be afraid, to not focus on circumstance, but Jesus, to keep our eyes fixed on you and that as you call us out onto the water, that our feet will remain strong because we're firmly grasping your hand and our eyes are locked on you. The maker of heaven and earth, the maker of all that is, the maker of the wind and the waves and that you love us. I pray that you would help us as a church to live out our faith as we are moved from this place where we would worship together, this building, that we, the church, will continue to walk in faith and not by sight. And we ask it in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.
And now receive the benediction, the good word. Now may we know the hope to which God has called us. Experience the glorious riches of the inheritance of the saints. And trust in his incomparably great power for all of us who believe. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing you soon.